Our first presentation this evening is by Dr. Patrick Bowen. Uh, Dr. Bowen is a religious studies scholar. He specializes in the history of religious conversion in the West. Uh, most of his recent work examines conversion to Islam in the U.S., which is the topic of his three-volume book, A History of Conversion to Islam in the United States. For his PhD, he specialized in Islam and the theory of religion. So we are all very excited to hear the presentation of Dr. Bowen. I am setting my timer so I don't go too long today. Well, I want to start by thanking uh, Fazil for inviting me here and for everyone welcoming me. I am very pleased to be able to uh, meet with the community that I found so interesting in my research uh, that's had so much impact on um, American Muslim history. And <clears throat> I will get into it a little bit later, but I do want to uh, mention that today's speech is really a quick overview. It's a cartoon, basically, of uh, the early legacies of Mirza Ghulam Ahmad and the Lahore Ahmadiyya movement. So all the details, I'm not going to be able to touch on um, in depth, but uh, the information will be in my books that you can look up later. So we're trying something new today, just to let you know uh, the uh, PowerPoint is <laughs> down in the hands of uh, Mr. Khan, Dr. Khan, and uh, so we'll have to work around this, but I think we can do this pretty well. So uh, just to let you know, I've been studying this topic of uh, the history of conversion to Islam in the United States for about nine years, since around 2008. Uh, this has culminated in uh, the three books that uh, Fazil has mentioned. Uh, the first one came out in 2015. This was on the white American Muslims who converted before 1975. Uh, number two, uh, next, uh, is about to come out here. One more. Uh oh, you skipped it. Oh, well, that's all right. Oh, well, that's all right. Uh, it'll, it'll come out here in uh, October of this year, and it's about African American Muslims back. A couple. You can leave it there, that's fine. Um, and it'll come out in October. And then the third volume uh, will hopefully come out by 20, uh, 2020, and that should be about uh, Afri uh, actually uh, conversion to Islam of all ethnicities since 1975. Uh, so all the topics I'll be discussing today can be found in these books, especially the first two. And because I, as you can see right here, will be focusing on up to the year 1975, which is my area of specialization. Okay, we have a new participant. <laughs> All right, so uh, just to go over one more time, uh, the topics are the impacts of Mirza Ghulam Ahmad and the Lahore Ahmadiyya movement in the U.S. between 1886, which is the first year we have evidence for contact and 1975. Next, please. And I'm going to be breaking this down into five distinct periods uh, to make it easier to understand. Uh, and so everyone can see all the different trends. <coughs> so for the first period, uh, if anyone here is familiar with the history of Islam in America, uh, there is a very prominent figure named Ale Alexander Russell Webb. Uh, he is not the first white convert to Islam, but he is the first prominent white convert to Islam. Uh, he uh, came to Islam in the late 1880s and would lead a movement in the 90s to promote knowledge of Islam and to help people embrace the religion. But the reason why he's so important to our topic today is because in late 1886, he began exchanging letters with Mirza Ghulam Ahmad. Uh, next, please. 
Now, these letters inspired Alexander Webb uh, to pursue Islam further. He uh, communicated to Mirza Ghulam Ahmad that he was not able to come out to India to study under him directly uh, because he could not afford to maintain his family's lifestyle while he was gone. But he was very interested in studying more under him. And he was also interested and willing to uh, promote Islam. This is prior to his conversion. And he did so. We have evidence that he sent out um, flyers to different newspapers around the country in 1886 and 1887. In, after a few years of study, uh, Webb did decide to uh, travel to the east. He obtained a job as an American consul in the Philippines. And he felt he could, should at least be uh, in Asia to study Islam. And by 1888, around mid-year, he did finally embrace the religion. Next, please. And then after uh, doing some fundraising efforts, he returned to the United States, uh, led his movement, which lasted for roughly three years. It did suffer uh, a few schisms along the way. Uh, but some of his early followers did start what was probably the first uh, formally organized mosque uh, in New York City in 1893. And uh, they made several newspapers that I've recently discovered were uh, read throughout the world. So we have evidence of them being read in uh, the Middle East and in India and even Japan. Uh, next, please. Now, it seems that uh, Webb uh, began to uh, ignore or not maintain his connections with Mirza Ghulam Ahmad and the Ahmadiyya movement uh, during the 1890s. But in the early 1900s, uh, these connections seem to have been revived. And uh, we do know in 1910, he helped with the revision of uh, the teachings of Islam. And Webb's name is on the book, and he is mentioned in the Ahmadiyya magazine uh, a little bit later. Next, please. Next. Uh, next. And one more. All right. So how did Webb come to contact Mirza Ghulam Ahmad originally? Well, this had been some mystery. Um, I actually discovered the initial uh, source of his knowledge about Mirza Ghulam Ahmad. And it was in the September 1886 issue of a journal called The Theosophist. Uh, the Theosophist was the organ of a group called the Theosophical Society, which specialized in studying non-Christian religions. And Webb was an early member of this group. In fact, Webb was a um, member of the lodge, uh, which is like the branch of the, the first lodge to be established outside of the state of New York in the United States. And this was in St. Louis, and Webb was a member there. And many of the members were reading about various religions. And in September 1886, there was an article which contains a letter from Mirza Ghulam Ahmad and an advertisement uh, for his uh, first work. And in this advertisement, uh, he is inviting people to come to India to study underneath him uh, and where he will demonstrate them the miracles of the Quran and however he would require them to convert to Islam uh, once they came and witnessed this. Uh, this is what Webb was referring to when he said he could not visit India because he could not afford to maintain his family. Uh, and so now we know this is how Americans first came into contact with Mirza Ghulam Ahmad. Next, please. But Webb was not the only person, and this is one of the new discoveries I also uh, have made for the first book here. Uh, Thomas Moore Johnson was another member of this early Theosophical Lodge. He was actually a very prominent member in American Theosophy. He was on the board of directors. Uh, at the same time, he was the American president of a competing a cult organization called the Hermetic Brotherhood of Luxor. Uh, next, um, two, maybe two more times. And he was also the editor of a magazine that focused on religious and philosophical issues. 
Thomas More Johnson had been interested in Islam uh, since the early 1880s. And just a few months after Mirza Ghulam Ahmad uh, appeared in the Theosophical Journal, while Webb was communicating directly uh, with him, uh, Johnson went on and started the first Sufi organization in the United States. This is in 1887. Uh, it's called the Sufic Circle. It was made as a branch of the Hermetic Brotherhood of Luxor. It did not, does not seem to have, a long, have had a long life, but uh, the individuals who were involved with this uh, maintained a connection, maintained an interest in Islam and Sufism, and into the early 1900s, they had a new organization with a similar name. Now, we don't know if whether Webb was connected to this organization. However, he was connected to some of these individuals. Uh, for instance, he almost certainly was reading uh, Thomas More Johnson's books, and he has said that that is what converted him to Islam. Uh, but uh, Webb did maintain Islamic contacts with some of the members of this group. So in summary, we don't have evidence, direct evidence, that the appearance of Mir Mirza Ghulam Ahmad in the Theosophical Journal directly led to the creation of this first Sufi organization, formally organized Sufi organization. Uh, however, the timing and the fact that this occurred while Webb was uh, becoming interested in Islam uh, su is highly suggestive that there was a direct influence and that this is uh, an important legacy. Uh, next and next. So this is a copy of the original letter that was um, describing the creation of the Sufic circle. Okay, next please. All right, next. All right. So. There were a few other individuals, uh, mostly white Americans, who were in communication with Mirza Ghulam Ahmad uh, after Webb's time and in the 18, uh, I'm sorry, early 1900s and the 1910s. Uh, however, uh, these were isolated individuals and their legacy is very little known. Uh, as for the, after the emergence of the Lahore Ahmadiyya movement, uh, there was not a direct connection between Americans uh, for the first uh, 15 years or so. However, in the early 1930s, all that changed. Uh, the mosque in Woking, as I'm sure many people here know, uh, in Woking, England, was significantly influenced by the Lahore movement. And they started producing a lot of uh, materials namely the Islamic Review, which was one of the most widely read English language Muslim magazines in the world uh, between the First World War and the Second World War. Uh, this magazine uh, was also, in the early 1930s, the single most widely read uh, Orthodox English language Muslim magazine in the United States. So next, please. And so what happened was there was a concerted effort uh, made by the Woking community to send the magazine and other uh, Islamic materials uh, to libraries across the country and to uh, colleges and universities. And we start seeing in the letter section in the back of the magazine, we start seeing individuals, Americans, who are writing to the magazine inquiring about Islam, how they could convert if they could um, have more materials that they could look into. And uh, we start to see, just in the letter section of this magazine, a whole community develop. Well, at that time, there was an organization in the United States that was focused on converting people of all ethnicities to Islam, uh, to Orthodox Islam. And uh, this organization came into contact with the Woking community and started communicating with all the people who were writing letters to Woking. And as a result, this uh, group called the American Islamic Association uh, gained members from all across the country, and it was the largest uh, main, uh, Orthodox Muslim uh, Islamic group 
uh, in the United States in the 1930s. There were members in Massachusetts and as far away as Los Angeles. So uh, this is an important early legacy because this community, which was primarily made up of immigrant Muslims and uh, white American converts, uh, stayed together and in touch with each other uh, through the 1950s and even into the 1960s. And they would eventually have contact uh, with other smaller Muslim communities. And uh, Islam was spread primarily um, through uh, Lahore, uh, Ahmadiyya uh, materials that they sent out. Uh, next, please. OK, next. All right, one more. OK, uh, the third period. Now, this is somewhat overlapping with the second period because uh, this starts in the mid-1930s. Uh, and this is a sort of separate uh, movement of Lahore influence in the United States. Uh, this is a picture of the African-American uh, Qadiani Ahmadiyya movement um, in the early 1930s, uh, which was based primarily in Pittsburgh, but also throughout Ohio. And even in Columbus, there was a community. Uh, but what happened was in 1934, many of the members of this movement became very upset with the representative of the Qadiani community and ousted him. They said he was no longer welcome to lead them. And one of the leading African-American members had traveled to Philadelphia where he encountered a, an Egyptian that, and we were talking about this at dinner, uh, may have been in the Lahore community. And he returned to Pittsburgh where he encouraged all these members. There were uh, probably over a thousand uh, Muslims. He encouraged them to embrace uh, the Lahore movement. And if you hit next, please. That might be. Okay, so this, the Young Islam is a Lahore Ahmadiyya magazine from 1936. This article, although it says South America on there, is actually dealing with uh, Pittsburgh. So, <laughs> uh, and Saeed Ahmad was a member of the Qadian community, an African American member, and he decided, uh, he was in communication with the Lahore movement, and uh, the evidence is still kind of shaky. He's the earliest direct contact uh, we know uh, between the Lahore movement. But next, please. By 1937, we know that we have a, a paraphrase of a letter uh, that shows that uh, many of these individuals were explicitly identifying with the Lahore movement. This letter happens to be from probably the most famous mosque in the region, the first Cleveland mosque, uh, which was led by Wali Akram and, uh, for over 50 years. Uh, this letter comes from an FBI file when the uh, FBI was investigating the community. Uh, but it does show, as you can all see here, they were explicitly identifying with the Lahore movement. And next, please. And Recently, I was able to obtain a copy of the community's, one more, Articles of Faith from 1942. Uh, and at that time, you can see that we accept Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmad of Qadian as the Mujahideen reformer and promised Messiah of the 14th century, but there is no mention of Nabi or Prophet. So we know uh, that they were very explicitly committed to the Lahore movement at that time. Uh, they would later shed this um, unique and specific identity, uh, but the interests and connections with the Lahore movement were maintained uh, by many of the individuals who were involved with the Pittsburgh, or, I'm sorry, the Pennsylvania and Ohio community. Uh, they would maintain these connections into the 1960s and either join or start new organizations, most notably a group called the International Muslim Brotherhood, which was transported and started in uh, Philadelphia. And that will come up again shortly here. Uh, next, please. Uh, next, one more. So 
apparently the leaders of the Lahore movement uh, were unaware of all the things that were happening in uh, Philadelphia, in uh, Pennsylvania and Ohio. And <laughs> for some reason there must have been some miscommunication because they believed that there, was, there were no efforts to spread the Lahore Ahmadiyya movement in the United States by the early 1940s. In fact, they picked up a journal published by a member of the American Islamic Association, and they thought it was uh, very amateurish, and they believed that America needed a proper uh, proselytization from the Lahore movement, and they, at that time, decided to send out uh, their own missionary. Next, please. And in 1947, Get in a second here, 1947, uh, Bashir Minto uh, arrived in San Francisco. There it is, and there's the incorporation form for the Muslim Society of the USA Incorporated, uh, which was established in 1947 in San Francisco and became the main hub of Lahore Ahmadiyya uh, efforts in the United States uh, through the 1950s and apparently into the early 1960s. I need to get all that clarified here over the course of this conference, hopefully. <laughs> but um, uh, Mr. Minto, uh, next please, put a lot of effort into publications. He produced several uh, pamphlets. Uh, these two here are written by uh, white converts. One is uh, American and one's British, uh, Marmaduke Pickthall, um, I'm sure most people know or are aware of. Uh, he and many of the members of the community also sent uh, frequent letters to uh, Lahore Ahmadiyya magazines. This one is from the Islamic Review, but we can also see materials in the, uh, the Light, which was published in Lahore. Um, and they did a lot of promotional efforts uh, among college students. Uh, Mr. Minto's main concern, uh, the Lahore Ahmadiyya movement's main concern was obtaining uh, college-educated converts because they felt that that would be more prestigious and that would lead to, lead to the uh, improved spread of Islam in the United States if they uh, had college-educated converts. There were, nevertheless, uh, non-college-educated non converts. Uh, we do know of some prisoners who were converting uh, with the influence of the Lahore Ahmadiyya movement in the 1950s and uh, other individuals as well. Uh, however, that was not Mr. Minto's main concern, and his movement actually did not take off at that time, apparently because there was some, uh, because of this restriction on whom he would contact. Next, please. This leads us to the fifth and final period. In around 1955, uh, a man named Muhammad Abdullah uh, who was affiliated with the Lahore Ahmadiyya movement, had been a teacher of Islam in, F in the Fiji Islands. Uh, around 1955, he came to the United States for about 17 months. And at that time, he learned of the Nation of Islam. Next, please. And he began a correspondence with Elijah Muhammad, uh, the leader of the Nation of Islam at that time. Uh, Elijah Muhammad was asking uh, about religious issues, uh, and uh, they corresponded for a few years. Now, in the late 1950s, uh, Mr. Abdullah moved to the United States permanently, and apparently in 1958, this is a report we have, uh, he was invited to a dinner at Elijah Muhammad's home, and at that time, next please, he uh, met Elijah Muhammad's son, and who at that time was the heir apparent of the Nation of Islam, uh, Warth Dean Muhammad. And this connection led to a transformation of uh, Warth Dean's uh, vision of Islam. Warth Dean was soon made the minister of the Philadelphia Temple of the Nation of Islam in the early 1960s, and this enabled him to be in communication more thoroughly with uh, Mr. Abdullah. As I mentioned earlier, uh, some of the early African-American converts uh, in the Pennsylvania and Ohio region 
had formed an organization called the International Muslim Brotherhood. And that was based in Philadelphia. Because they had the uh, Lahore connection, uh, Mr. Abdullah, who was primarily based in California, where the other uh, Lahore Ahmadiyya movement uh, efforts were, made Philadelphia his second home and would travel there frequently. And it was there where he and Wartin Muhammad uh, came into contact and uh, where he influenced him significantly, teaching him more about uh, Orthodox Islam. And in 1964, Wartin uh, embraced publicly Orthodox Islam uh, following Malcolm X uh, doing the same thing. Now, another interesting uh, piece of history is that there were discussions between Wartin, Muhammad, and Malcolm X uh, about uniting their followings as an orth uh, a large Orthodox movement. Well, they were going to do so under the umbrella of the International Muslim Brotherhood, and presumably with the uh, with Mr. Abdullah serving as their spiritual advisor. Uh, in December 1964. Uh, Several members of Malcolm X's uh, organization went out to Philadelphia and met with members of the International Muslim Brotherhood. They prayed together. They studied Islam together. Uh, they did not, however, formalize this umbrella organization that was proposed. And uh, apparently nothing else came of that. In 1965, uh, Malcolm X uh, was assassinated and where Dean Muhammad returned to the Nation of Islam soon after that. Uh, this contact is important here because uh, later, after the passing of Elijah Muhammad in 1975, uh, when War Dean Muhammad uh, became the leader of the Nation of Islam, he made uh, Muhammad Abdullah uh, an important figure uh, in the new community. Uh, he made him a uh, respected elder and spiritual advisor to many people. He was featured in the group's newspapers. Uh, but this is uh, one of the early important legacies. Before uh, 1977, when the Lahore Ahmadiyya movement uh, formally organized in the United States. And um, so those are the five periods. And I wanted to, um, even though I went over this very quickly, I didn't get into a lot of the details and the names, which I think a lot of people here would find interesting. I think it was important uh, to bring this stuff to light because very few people know about this. Almost everything I've talked about here, particularly after discussing Alexander Russell Webb, uh, has not been published before. This, these are all, except I think maybe this last piece right here, uh, the, many of these are new revelations that I think many people in your community may not be aware of. And uh, I am very pleased to have been able to research this topic. So I want to thank everybody here, um, especially Fazil for the invitation to come and speak. And um, I hope the rest of this conference goes very well. Thank you.